what happens to the world when it becomes education, educated? What's happening is what we can call an education revolution. All over the world, people are getting more and more educated. People who did not have access to schools and universities now do. The darker the color of the country behind me, the more educated the entire population is. This has been a dramatic effect in just about 100 years. Your grandparents, or your, if you're young, your grandparents' parents, lived in a world where the average person in the world was illiterate. That's changed in just 50 years. It's not only basic education. Now, one out of five people around the world who are youth are in some kind of higher education. What has this done to the world? And we found that even small amounts of education help people think in very different ways. They tend to think more abstractly. They tend to be able to marshal their cognitive uh, enhanced skills to solve new problems. We also have gone to Africa. We went to, to Ghana, north of Accra. Same kinds of folks. But here we asked, what's the effects of all this cognitive enhancement? And we focused on what people understood about the tragic HIV. And we, we looked at people without education and people with education. And we were interviewing a man who had no education, was illiterate. And he passed around this kind of material all the time. The West has spent uh, billions and billions of dollars on getting the simple facts out. And so we asked him, as we did everybody, about some causes of HIV. And we said, can you get HIV from a blood transfusion? And his face lit up, and he said, yes, but not if you wear a condom. <laughs> it's funny and tragic. This man does not have the skills to put together a working theory of that disease. Education, basic education, has saved millions of lives all around the world. We need to start to understand this, both scientifically and politically. Education is the major social vaccine against all kinds of diseases. Rising childhood obesity worldwide. The smoking epidemic in Asia. The high birth rates in the southern part of the world, which are still very uh, uh, large and very problematic. Keeping children lives. The number one factor is if the mothers had some education. I went to school. I went to school not because the mass is women or girls who are going to school. It's because my mother was denied an education. And she constantly reminded me and my siblings that she never wanted us to live the life she was living. As I went back, I started talking to the men to the village and, and mothers, and I said, I want to give back the way I had promised you that I would come back and help you. What do you need? As I speak to the women, they told me, you know what we need? We really need a school for girls, they, because there had not been any school for girls. And the reason they wanted the school for girls is because when a girl is raped when she's walking to school, the mother is blamed for that. If she got pregnant before she got married, the mother is blamed for that, and she's punished, she's beaten. They said we wanted to put our girls in a safe place. As, as we moved, and I went to talk to the fathers. The fathers, of course, you can imagine what they said. We want a school for boys. And I said, well, there are a couple of many men from my village who have been out and they have got an education. Why can they build a school for boys and now build a school for girls? That made sense, and they agreed. <laughs> and I told them, I wanted them to show me a sign of commitment. And they did. They donated land where we built the girls' school we have. As a new dawn is happening in my school, a new beginning is happening. Girls, as we speak right now, 125 girls will never be mutilated. 125 girls will not be married when they are 12 years old. 125 girls are creating and achieving their dreams. This is the, the, the thing that we are doing, giving them opportunities so that they can rise. As we speak right now, women are not being beaten because of the revolutions we've started in our community. Let's start with why this is important. Well, all of us here, I'll bet, had some great teachers. 
Uh, we all had a wonderful education. That's part of the reason we're here today, part of the reason we're successful. Uh, I can say that, even though I'm a college dropout. Uh, I had great teachers. And in fact, in the United States, the teaching system has worked fairly well. There are fairly effective teachers in a narrow uh, set of places. So the top 20% of students have gotten a good education. And those top 20% have been the best in the world, if you measure them against the other top 20%. And they've gone on to create the revolutions in software and, and biotechnology and keep the US at the forefront. Now, the strength for those top 20% is starting to fade on a relative basis, but even more concerning is the education that the balance of people are getting. Uh, not only has that been weak, it's getting weaker. And if you look at the economy, it really is only providing opportunities now to people with a better education. And so we have to change this. We have to change it so that people have equal opportunity, we have to change it so that the country is strong and, and, and stays in the forefront of things that are, are driven by advanced education like science and mathematics. When I first learned the statistics, I was pretty stunned at how bad things are. Over 30% of kids never finish high school. For minority kids, it's over 50%. And even if you graduate from high school, if you're low income, you have less than a 25% chance of ever completing a college degree. If you're low income in the United States, you have a higher chance of going to jail than you do of getting a four-year degree. And that you know, doesn't seem entirely fair. So how do you make education better? Now, our foundation for the last nine years has invested in this. There's many people working on it. Uh, we've worked on small schools, uh, we've funded scholarships, we've done things in libraries. Uh, a lot of these things had a good effect. But the more we looked at it, the more we realized that having great teachers was the very key thing. I believe fundamentally, as many speakers have said during the past few days, that we make very poor use of our talents. Very many people go through their whole lives having no real sense of what their talents may be or if they have any to speak of. I meet all kinds of people who don't think they're really good at anything. I meet all kinds of people who don't enjoy what they do. They simply go through their lives getting on with it. Uh, they get no great pleasure from what they do. They endure it rather than enjoy it and wait for the weekend. But I also meet people who love what they do and couldn't imagine doing anything else. If you said to them, don't do this anymore, they'd wonder what you're talking about. Because it isn't what they do, it's who they are. They say, but this is me. You know, it would be foolish for me to abandon this because it speaks to my most authentic self. And it's not true of enough people. In fact, on the contrary, I think it's still true of a minority of people. And I think there are many possible explanations for it. And high among them is education. Because education, in a way, dislocates very many people from their natural talents. And human resources are like natural resources. They're often buried deep. You have to go looking for them. They're not just lying around on the surface. You have to create the circumstances where they show themselves. And you might imagine education would be the way that happens, but too often, it's not. Every education system in the world is being reformed at the moment. And it's not enough. Reform is no use anymore, because that's simply improving a broken model. What we need, and the word's been used many times during the course of the past few days, is not evolution, but a revolution in education. This has to be transformed into something else.